Okay, so next up we have um, Peter Heppenstall, who's the Vice President of Sustainability APAC from Barclays. And then in addition we have Calvin Queck, who before um, is the Head of Sustainable Finance Program from Greenpeace. Um, Yang Bin was also supposed to join. Uh, he's from the Shanghai Pudong Bank. Um, unfortunately, though, the China Banking Regulatory Committee had a meeting, and so he will not be able to join us tonight. Um, so, yeah, Peter, Calvin, please come up. Thank you. Uh, Thanks very much, uh, and I echo Veronique's uh, excellent presentation. It's quite a challenge to be uh, towards the end of a speaker, uh, speaking event. I'm sure you've been saturated with a lot of information today, so um, I don't have any PowerPoint uh, presentation to distract you, and I I'll make my, uh, uh, my presentation, which is a paper um, we're also delivering to COP20 next year, uh, quite, quite succinct. Uh, we've got some quite significant messages to deliver on the uh, commercial or financial side of sustainability. So, um, uh, first off, good, good afternoon, and uh, I'm most delighted and, uh, and quite, quite privileged to be able to speak at this forum today. Um, we're doing a lot more of these presentations, uh, uh, in fact, this year more uh, than we've ever done before uh, as invitees to sustainability and environmental forums. Um, and I'm going to use the opportunity to share not just my company's ambition uh, on sustainability or specifically environmental sustainability, um, but to actually tell you a little bit more about how the financial services sector is, uh, is making noise in this space. Um, sustainability uh, is what we call citizenship uh, in my company, in Barclays. Um, we see it something that is now quite central to our brand. Uh, it's not just a regional aspiration, and my role is purely in Asia Pacific and the Middle East and, and, uh, and our very large market in India. It's a global aspiration, and we see it as being very central to our strategic vision for our brand and for our organisation. Um, as I mentioned, it's very encouraging to see that in forums such as these are increasingly in frequency and in size, uh, and we're actually creating some really constructive dialogue in what are some extremely profound challenges that our world is facing and will continue to face in the future. Uh, these issues are not going away. So the issues that surround the environment, be they lack of resources, be they clean energy, uh, be they clean air or climate change, are very real, they're very visible, and they are that question reaching a critical tipping point. The concussion of these issues are very real and they are catastrophic and they affect our and the planet's species in what we perceive to be a potentially ruinous way. The economic impact has been uh, addressed, I think, by a number of different speakers, um, and it's costing the world a very conservative 1.2 trillion US dollars a year, and that is a conservative number. Uh, and there's no doubt at all that these costs are going to increase in the future unless we find, very quickly, radical new solutions. Already at this level, the cost of uh, inaction is now greater than the cost of action by a long way. The, the, uh, the balance has tipped quite dramatically. Uh, this is not just our conclusion in Barclays. It's the conclusion of Philippe Calderon's new Climate Economy Commission. And it's also an experience shared by many, many of our clients. And I note that uh, uh, one of the earlier speakers from uh, an international manufacturer estimated there uh, cost of natural disasters alone at about 300 million euros a year. Uh, and that, again, is a conservative number. The problems are complex. They're long-term. Uh, they need big organisations and governments and NGOs to collaborate to address them. This is a collaborative effort that is going to be required. Uh, at my company at Barclays, addressing the matters of climate change and global warming and all of the calamitous consequences relate to these very big issues are central to our vision, plainly and simply because businesses which don't deal with it, uh, they simply won't survive. This is not uh, altruism, this is just hard-nosed reality. It's, it's factual. Rather than focus on the problems here today, I want to talk a little bit about both the solutions and the opportunities that exist for firms who are leading this agenda. 
And I'm sure that many of you are aware of Barclays, or I hope you are too, uh, hopefully because we're one of the oldest and largest financial institutions in the world, and not simply because we are the name behind the, uh, the English Premier League soccer. Uh, according to relbanks.com, we are the 10th largest bank globally by our total balance, uh, balance sheet assets, and we fu understand fully the responsibility that comes with our brand. We directly employ more than 120,000 staff around the world. We engage suppliers more than double that number. We occupy tens of millions of square metres of property. And we provide finance to business and industry in the many, many hundreds of billions of dollars. Our footprint in Asia is large, and our presence in Greater China and Hong Kong in particular uh, has been a very long one. Uh, we understand the importance of China as a marketplace, and we're seeking to partner and to grow with the formidable and impressive China banks, uh, such as the China Agricultural Bank and the China Development Bank, and we marvel at the enormous and remarkable manufacturing and export industry of China that dominates global supply and has done for a number of decades. We understand and applaud too that China was one of the first governments to demonstrate tangible collaboration between the banking regulator, the CBRC, and the environmental ministry in pursuit of more sustainable operations with their green credit program. And we see this to be an exceptional and outstanding model that other countries can follow. However, my talk today is on the issue of environmental sustainability and the importance that we, as one of the key players in the financial sector, have in establishing and then driving positive influence on what is undoubtedly one of the most critical issues the world as a, face, uh, world as a whole is facing, and it is a matter that we at Barclays take extremely seriously. The concept and practice of sustainability is the central axis around which all of these issues must be addressed. Critically, these issues will not be solved by a single organisation in isolation. We must work together across our sector and beyond to develop effective and sustainable partnerships. As the economic axis of the planet shifts, so does the moral authority and the financial power. The extent of the new fast-growth economic and political powers to, to steer the sustainability agenda is as real as it is astounding, and it is doing so in China especially. That's why we're actually all of us here in China today. It's why there are so many people in this room. It is why the banking regulators are steering banks in this direction for the first time in their history. A, a very strong example of this is something called the Banking Environmental Initiative, the BEI, uh, which is Barclays' chief executive officer, our number one executive in the, in, in the world, chairs, and in which we take a very active role. The Banking Environmental Initiative's primary focus is on delivering sustainable solutions which respond to client and to market needs and to initiate and support industry-wide collaboration to deliver momentum. In its most recent forum in Hong Kong in June of this year, uh, Mr Jenkins led a group of representatives of global financial institutions and global insurers to specifically explore ways that banks can work with their clients to promote sustainable means of production. We want to incentivize it. It is all starting, uh, and in fact it has started, with a soft commodities compact that includes timber, pulp, paper, soya, and in particularly with palm oil. The Hong Kong Forum laid down the grade work, groundwork for the Banking Environmental Initiative to broaden its remit by including more financial institutions and companies in its working groups and by intensifying its engagement in Asia. China will be pivotal and critical in this whole program. The foundation BEI members, who are Barclays, uh, Deutsche Bank, uh, Westpac, Nomura, Lloyd, Santander, SMBC, Northern Trust, and quite proudly the China Construction Bank, gave an absolute commitment to build on the BEI's alliance with the commodities and consumer goods companies in order to combat the critical issue of global deforestation. Whilst not all BEI members have fully endorsed the compact, there is a growing groundswell of support for this and other initiatives by communities, by governments and by industry sectors. More and more banks are joining the BEI, the last two being Standard Chartered and the very large Goldman Sachs institution uh, in the last two months alone. We collectively now have a very, very loud voice and we demand to be heard. 
It was agreed that the BEI would push ahead with a program to foster sustainable trade in the agricultural commodities via such financial products as the BEI's recently introduced sustainable shipment letters of credit. These are financial instruments that can be used by banks to incentivise the international trade of sustainably produced commodities and the International Finance Corporation, the IFC, have confirmed that it will offer preferential terms for this type of shipment to its partner banks and to offer significant potential reductions in the cost of capital. It is responsible banking at its very best. The chief executive officers of some of the world's biggest buyers of agricultural commodities through the Consumer Goods Forum have made public commitments to transform their supply chain practices. By 2020, their palm oil, soya, paper, pulp and beef supply chains will be hoping to achieve zero net deforestation. And to deliver the goal, this goal, these companies have set deadlines by which they will be procuring only those commodities that were produced in line with recognised standards, such as R the RSPO in the case of palm oil. The banking industry and the financial services sector through the BEI has been working closely with these companies to establish how, in practical terms, banking services can be aligned with this major client-led transformation. A comprehensive paper has been authored that describes a documented trade finance solution developed by a group of leading commodity buyers, by trading houses, by international trade finance banks, by the big development banks, by trade finance industry bodies and international NGOs. The paper details the simple means by which internationally recognised sustainability standards associated with individual commodities can be integrated into these letters of credit. These will support the international trade of commodities in a very positive, influential manner. By allowing trade finance banks to differentiate between sustainable shipments and conventional shipments, letters of credit open up the opportunity for banks to incentivise growth in the trade of sustainably produced commodities. These mechanisms are now in place and are being delivered with both momentum and with scale. The billion dollar palm oil industry is the first sector to be affected and these sustainable letters of credit are being issued as we speak. Our bank alone have issued eight this year. For the Banking Environmental Initiative, we have an absolute determination to help change the world for the better, and we head a forum of like-thinking financial institutions that will, without question at all, introduce positive change in responsible banking. We have a very clear roadmap and a moral compass to drive this journey to conclusion. Make no mistake, though, no one sector of society can solve this on its own. Governments, businesses, NGOs need to work together on a global scale in a manner that is pragmatic, that is systematic and practical. Barclays and our competitors see this very clearly and we are investing heavily in these markets. We see Africa, which has been mentioned by a number of speakers today, as being a huge and developing market, which needs much support. And to this end, we recently invested US $500 million in supporting the solar energy business on the continent. And we are not alone in this, in this arena. In New York, on the 1st of October, we announced our commitment to invest at least 1 billion English pounds of our liquidity pool into the green bond market. These bonds are designed to raise capital for, to fund low carbon, low carbon and no carbon projects, such as wind farms, and our commitment represents by far the largest investment by a bank in the history in this sector. We also like to see ourselves as walking the talk, and this is actually the primary message I would like to deliver to you today. Large banks and manufacturers and the very big companies that I see represented in the audience today uh, need to lead by example. And this is in the, man the, the manner that we conduct our businesses, the education that we provide to our staff, the process of delivering responsibility in the communities in which we operate, and by setting very clear and positive examples. In my company, Barclays, our real estate decisions are based now on occupying energy efficient and environmentally efficient buildings. This is not only a responsible decision, but it is an increasingly more commercially viable option. With the spiralling cost of energy and the uh, energy scarcity that exists on the planet, it is actually just simply good business. We are engaging the real estate market to let them know our preference for green buildings 
and we are saying to our suppliers of buildings and our suppliers of computers and our suppliers of IT equipment and stationery and furniture and all those other things that a business needs to, uh, to function, that if you want to do business with us, you need to demonstrate responsibility and you need to demonstrate a duty of care and commitment to the environment. And we will support you in these endeavours and we will ultimately evaluate you on your environmental duty of care. But at the end of the day, we will not tolerate poor performance or nonchalance in the environmental arena. And there will be a point in time that we will admonish poor performers and we will not purchase their goods or services at all. And that time is rapidly coming. A very good example, and I have many to give, but one quite good one of this occurred in this region some three or four years ago when we went to tender in our business for our Asia-Pacific courier services. Uh, we moved thousands of pieces of, uh, of mail and packages from, uh, from country to country by both uh, road and by air, and one of the principal criteria we set in our request for pricing was for a global vendor to step up and capture the amount of carbon that was consumed for every transaction and every consignment that was conducted for our bank. The US courier, who I will not name uh, for confidential reasons, did step up. Uh, and they built a proprietary system that they were already tinkering with, specifically for Barclays. Uh, they were not only able to capture the carbon that was consumed for each of the bank's career transactions, but they went one step further and actually offset it on our behalf. And there's a sort of customer or partner or vendor that we'd like to do business with because they're thinking the same thoughts as us. They're making a difference to the environmental standard. Their program they called Go Green. Uh, they later launched it globally. Uh, and we now utilize, utilize it in other parts of the world. It is something that uh, we are very proud of, they are very proud of, uh, and it wasn't at all difficult to, to implement. Uh, the supplier offer it to many of their other corporate clients. It is immensely popular, it is hugely successful, and it was very good business on their behalf. We're also now pushing into the renewable energy arena and are requesting that our landlords that of the buildings that we occupy allow us or in fact support us in installing clean energy solutions. We've already illuminated many of our large corporate signs in the Asia-Pacific region by solar power in South Africa where we uh, have a controlling interest in the ABSA uh, retail bank. We operate a large solar farm that feeds one of our landmark buildings and we are now looking at building uh, big two, three, four megawatt solar farms to, uh, to power out our buildings and our substantial operations in India. On cost and resilience factors alone, it's beginning to make commercial sense, but we wish to also deliver a message to the communities in which we operate that we are an environmentally responsible firm, that we do understand the scarcity of petroleum resources, we understand that fossil fuels are a scarce and diminishing resource and carbon does cause damage. And we see great social and economic benefit in harnessing the power of both the wind and the sun. We see further potential, particularly in wind power, uh, and in our own operations and our own investment portfolios, we are actively seeking out how to more effectively uh, partner up and invest in the renewable energy sector. And these are just some of the examples of the expectations that our customers are having of us. Barclays want to be seen as leaders in the area of sustainability uh, and we acknowledge quite clearly we don't have all the answers. However, we see this as an opportunity to play our part in being better global citizens but also as a sensible opportunity to gain commercial advantage that is beyond simply a mandatory requirement. We see it to be a fundamental and increasingly essential part of the way that we do our business. Being a responsible brand is also part of responsible banking and we wish to share our passion and experience with our China friends and our fellow banks. Uh, we simply must. So thanks again very much for allowing me to share this update with you. And I look forward to hearing from other speakers, uh, uh, particularly tomorrow. And I'd just like to quickly, and, and in conclusion, make a note that uh, I have a colleague or an ex-colleague uh, with me today, uh, Dr. Catherine Wong from the... Uh, a Singaporean national that is employed by a think tank from the James Cook University and has come here all the way from Cairns. She is doing some critical research uh, on the financial services sector and is looking to, uh, to speak to 
uh, bankers, insurers, big business. Uh, Catherine's in Shanghai until Thursday. Uh, I'm unfortunately leaving tomorrow. Then she's going to be in Beijing, uh, I think, for five days uh, next week. So if you could spare the time to actually uh, uh, meet with Catherine and my, uh, myself either after this session or, or sometime tomorrow uh, so we can introduce each other. Again, she's doing some really important research that it will, uh, will help us make some critical decisions. So thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, it's been a pleasure, a, a privilege, a delight, and uh, thank you, Shanghai, for the clean air that I've been able to breathe since I've been here as well. Thank you.